Good morning, everyone. My name is Chip Edens, and I'm here with my colleagues, Laura Conitzer and Leslie Peace. And we're here today to talk about history and exploring how we understand history and what we can draw upon the lessons of history. It's our high honor to welcome Professor Annette Gordon-Reed, who is an American historian and a law professor. She's currently the Carl M. Loeb University Professor at Harvard. And she is noted for many things, including the changing scholarship on Thomas Jefferson regarding his relationship with Sally Hemings and her children. In 2008, she published The Hemings of Monticello, which recounts the history of four generations of the African-American Hemings family from their African and Virginia origins until the 1826 death of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, her work, which we're gonna explore today, is was significantly in depth studying legal records, diaries, farm books, letters, wills, newspapers, archives and oral history. Uh, she was of course awarded the Pulitzer Prize for history. And uh, it is again, uh, a wonderful honor to welcome you, uh, Annette, to the Faith Forum. Glad to be here, thank you for inviting me. So I wanna begin with, uh, you know, just some basic questions. And that is, in light of the fact that we seem to be, you know, struggling with history, I suppose we always have. Mm -hmm. But particularly uh, over the last year, as we've come to terms with a number of things, and as we continue to come to terms and a reckoning uh, with our with our history, could you speak to just the work of of an historian? Uh, what is that work, and and how do historians determine what is truth? Mm -hmm. Well, it's a tough question. History is more art than science. There's no precise formula for it, but what history historians try to do is to look at the past, gather information, and try to figure out what people thought they were doing during that time period, what they wanted to do, why they did certain things, and you gather as much information as you can to try to give you the most accurate picture. You're never going to have perfection. We can't, we don't have a time machine. You can't go back and record everything, but you piece it together using every available bit of evidence and information that you have. Um, and it's a difficult topic depending upon, it can be more difficult depending upon what area you're looking at. I write about Jefferson and the early American Republic and that is something that's well documented. So there, there's a lot of information about Jefferson, his 19,000 letters, the letters you know, that people wrote to him, official documents, all those kinds of things. But if you're writing about enslaved people um, or other what historians sometimes refer to as marginalized people, there's not as much information. So you have to be more creative there. It's not just a matter of documents. You can look at archaeology. You could, you could take oral history and uh, family history and corroborate it with other kinds of documents that you might find. So depending upon what the subject area is, the historian will bring different tools and different perspectives to the task of setting forth what happened in a particular person's life or a particular country's, the life of a particular country or events. You've spoken uh, of, of history as a moral enterprise. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? It means that you don't just look at the past and accept whatever happened. You know, th there were things that happened in the past that are so out, that stretch the, uh, the boundaries of what we consider to be humane behavior. And you, you comment upon it. You don't, you're not silent about all of it. It's not about sitting in judgment upon people, but you take note when things are outside of some understanding about the way human beings should be treated, the way things should take place, the slaughter of children, the things that tax you as a human being, you have to take note of that. Uh, it's a, I said before that history is an art. There are lines to draw. It's a balancing function because a lot of times people had very different, in the past, had different ideas about how to do things. And we have to acknowledge that. But we also see things, try to see things from the perspective of the people who were acted upon, for example, 
uh, uh, the slaughtered children and say, it's not about the people who are just doing the act, it's about what effect it had on the people you know, who, who are suffering. So you have to take note of those kinds of things. We're not, we're not totally neutral and it's, it's almost too much to ask human beings to turn a blind eye to things that pique your moral sense as you're reading about it. Um, the separation of parents um, from their children uh, through sale, that even at the time, even not, I'm not even just talking about the people who suffered under that, there were other people at the time who saw that and knew that it was wrong. So yes, it, it's about finding, you know, finding those things that, or, or taking note of those things that prick our conscience and tell the reader about this. And the reader may not go along with you, but that's what I, I think historians have to do is to be true to that inner voice, those inner feelings that you have about the events that you are looking at and describing. I wanna think with you a little bit about legacy, uh, because I think, again, this is uh, something that we see being debated in our culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is understanding legacy in light of, in light of what you've said uh, in the context of the, of the moral arc. Mm -hmm. When we think about uh, the conversations that we've been having now, there's an argument uh, that says uh, people are, were a product of their historical context. Mm -hmm. um, and that seems to be one res response. And so there is a sense of uh, almost giving those folks a pass. Um, on the other hand, I think we see uh, the quite, quite the opposite, which is uh, people that in history that are essentially uh, retried, their case is retried. Mm -hmm. and their statues are torn down and, uh, and they're all, all but erased from history. Um, what do you make of, of, about that broad uh, spectrum of responses? And how do you adjudicate uh, between those responses as an, and, and come up with an appropriate response as we try to think about how we remember someone and their legacy? Well, you have to think about you do acknowledge that people are products of their time, but it goes back to what I said before, it's a question of perspective. I mean, the people who are well-known enough or say famous enough to be considered actors in history did things that affected other people's lives. And you're not just seeing things from their perspective. They may not have been at a point where they were, uh, they understood or cared about the effects of their actions upon other people. But as I said, the, the people who were acted upon, they had a perspective too. And there were people very often around them who knew better, uh, who what we would consider to be, who knew better, who had a different view about those kinds of things. So you're always taking account of the, the context, but you're thinking about the whole context, not just seeing things through the eyes of one group of people. It's putting everybody's, um, attitudes, everybody's responses, everybody's actions, everybody's, you know, the problems that they have into some kind of perspective and taking it as a whole. As for erasing things, I mean, there's been so much erasure on, of lots of people that people that we don't know, that was part of my work has been about trying to bring the voices of people who were erased into the story. So I'm very sensitive to that, to that kind of thing. Uh, very often when people suggest that we're erasing things, erasing people, if you think about taking down monuments, for example, and Confederate monuments are the things that have been have sort of sparked um, most of the controversy. Now, it's been extended to other people, but that was sort of the starting place. You know, in terms of legacy, you have to think of what, what is the substance of that legacy? Are the people who are being honored, do they give us something that we can't get other places, or do they give us things that are toxic? Mm -hmm. And I have said this openly, I think that Confederate monuments in public spaces give us messages that are toxic. The ideals of the Confederacy, and I'm not talking about honor, valor, the kinds of things we associate with soldiers um, throughout the ages, not all soldiers, but people fighting a cause, those things can be gotten other places. The values of the Confederacy were um, put forth in their constitution 
and in the famous speech by Alexander Stevens, the cornerstone speech in which both of those documents, the, the Confederate Constitution and the cornerstone speech explaining what the Confederacy about say that they're, the cornerstone of that society was African inferiority and African slavery, that African people were born or destined by God to be enslaved to white people. That's not a value that we want to promote that I, I don't, I hope that most people don't want to promote today. So given the sort of blatant understanding of what that was about, what their, what their leaders said it was about, and we very often talk about the declaration and the constitution as guiding principles for the American union. When we see what the Confederacy was about, it's, it's a tough thing to think of us going forward as a society black and white, other people of color, a diverse society, honoring people in public spaces. I'm not talking about cemeteries or private property or things like that, but on the courthouse square, people who said that Africans were inferior and were meant to be enslaved. That, that, legacy, that is the legacy of the Confederacy. Uh, I've sort of con contrast this with the founding generation uh, a Washington or Jefferson, who were slaveholders, who were both slaveholders, who at the same time, particularly with the Declaration, gave us documents and values that we still adhere to, uh, unlike the Cornerstone speech or the Confederate Constitution. So I, it's a, I understand why people feel that they are just like the Confederates, but I think that there's a difference. There's mm -hmm. a difference between wanting to destroy the Union, the United States of America, and creating it mm -hmm. uh, for their faults. We have to talk about their faults, but I think that the commemoration of what they did in public spaces strikes me as very different from the, Confeder uh, the, uh, the legacy or thinking about the legacy of the Confederacy. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm intrigued that uh, often we are, we think it's an either or, yeah. but I think the, the the work of history is to, to bring more truth to the, that reality and, and, yeah. and begin to reassess le what legacy means and what kind yeah. of legacy we want to carry on. But I'm also really intrigued by uh, this kind of historical advocacy uh, that, that you seem to have engaged in, which this sort of vital sacred work of giving voice to people who did not have a voice, who were, who have, who have stories that still need to be told. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Well, it, no, no, it, it's, it, it's an important thing. I mean, even if, if you're interested, say, in Jefferson, let's just put it this way, you're a person who's interested in Jefferson, you don't really care about, um, you don't know that you care about enslaved people and, and the people around him, you can't really know Jefferson without knowing these people. You mm -hmm. can't. Uh, you, you have a limited view of him. If you're genuinely trying to you know, understand what his life was like, the life of any, uh, or Washington for that example, but particularly Jefferson, given his personal circumstances with his wife and with Sally Hemings and the way he responded to people at Monticello, this one particular family, uh, you can't really know him without knowing them. So Mm -hmm. uh, the, the picture, if you really want a full picture, if you want just a partial picture to sort of satisfy, um, you know, you like Jefferson, you like Washington, you're a buff in some way, then that's one thing. But if you really want to know the person, mm -hmm. you have to know the world that he inhabited when he was at Monticello, the world that, you know, that sort of drove his life. And that's, that's, that can only be done if you take the entire picture together. One other thing I wanted to say about legacy is that we're not going to forget who Robert E. Lee was. He will be in history books. He will live in history books. Alexander Stevens will live in history books, but that's a separate thing. We have to talk about them, but that's separate from public celebrations in courthouse squares and things of that nature. So it's not about erasure. My point is it's not an erasure. They're not going to be erased because just as we have to talk about enslaved people, to get the entire picture you of what America was about. You have to talk about them as well, the Confederacy as well, as, as what happened in the 1860s, why it happened and how it continues to affect us today. Mm -hmm.
Well, I, I, it's so helpful to me uh, to hear that what you just said, which is that to know Jefferson is to know the Hemings. It's to know the whole story. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, candidly, um, my own journey, uh, what, growing up in Richmond mm -hmm. and seeing uh, Monument Avenue mm -hmm. uh, and never really thinking about what that meant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and going up to Monticello countless times. I can remember uh, getting on the bus <laughs> and going up to Monticello and, and hearing stories told. And it was always a story of this, this you know, extraordinary man who uh, thought great thoughts and uh, had great vision for so many different things. Um, and yet, as you speak of it, uh, Monticello was a plantation yeah. uh, and where there are about 150 slaves uh, and the broader story. And, uh, and there, I think for me, there's something obviously very painful about you know, rethinking history. Uh, but to me, the truth telling is so powerful. And it seems to me to, that's, a, that's the work that we have to do is what is the truth telling in order uh, for there to be a, a, both a measure of understanding and healing mm -hmm. and a sense of the trajectory of how we move forward. Uh, exactly. So we're going to get in more into that in a little bit, but I want to turn things over to my, uh, my colleague, Laura, who's you know, going to get into some of the detail of the book and how, mm -hmm. and how you put the book together. Okay. Thank you. And I, I just want to say again, what a, a complete honor it is to meet with you and have this discussion. Um, I mentioned to you earlier that we, as part of our outreach, Good Books um, Book Club, Goodreads Book Club, uh, read The Hemingses of Monticello in, um, in September. And it, it was just such an interesting story. And I'd love to dive into that a little bit. Okay. Um, I guess first, I would love to for us to hear about what approach you took as you were starting your research and your um, investigation into this family um, from a maybe from a forensic and even legal standpoint. The some of the things you had to go through as you started mm -hmm. um, your journey into these these books. Well, uh, I was able to do this because Jefferson kept lots of records of Monticello. He kept something called a memorandum books, his memorandum books, which now is two volumes uh, of books over a thousand pages. And he kept a record of every expenditure that he made from his 20s up until his 80s when he died. And it's a day-to-day -day record of where he, where he spent his money, sending people on errands, doing things himself. And there are a lot of references to members of the Hemings family there. When he marries Martha um, in 1772, he inherits, well, and actually he marries Martha. He gets the right to uh, inherit the property of Martha's father. When she dies, when he dies, the Hemings family and 135 other people come to live at Monticello. And he immediately makes one of the Hemingses, Robert Hemings, his valet, his personal valet. Robert is 12. He replaces a manservant, Jupiter Evans, who was Jefferson's same age, um, with Robert Hemings. And so Robert goes around with him all along the Eastern Seaboard when he's in Philadelphia writing the declaration, Robert is there. And there are references in Jefferson's memorandum books to Robert, gave Robert, you know, this amount of money to go buy this, bought shirts for Robert, did this or that and the other. So I can sort of keep track of what was going on with Robert on a daily basis uh, for long stretches of time. Same things with James Hemings and Rob and, and others as well. So what I had to do was to get a handle on references to members of the Hemings family in letters, in these memorandum books, and to just try to chart out you know, how they interacted with Jefferson. And it was, I'm, I'm fortunate because those records were there. This was not a matter so much in, in getting the family down of doing lots of, you know, research in other archives, it, that was available. When I started writing about 
um, the Hemings's father, John Wales, actually went to England to do, because he was an immigrant from England, to do some research on his family tree. And then when I when you sort of move out and try to talk about the time period, then that's where other archives, other uh, sources of information come into play. Because you're not just writing about, I was not just writing about these individual people. I wanted to draw a picture of the time that they lived in. So that required you know, information about Virginia in the 18th century, slavery in Virginia in the 18th century, and looking at you know, court records, looking at the letters of other people who describe the time. It's not just, so you, you're researching around the topic to try to fill the picture out. But fortunately I had a lot to work with. There's been a lot, I mean, Virginia is a much studied place and um, there's a lot of material to work with. Yeah. Well, and I, I wonder um, why, when, when we know that um, historically it was, quite commonplace for a plantation owner to have relations with any number of enslaved women on their plantations. But why is the story of Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson important um, to tell? Well, it was important because it has been important. It was contentious for many years because Jefferson is a member of the founding generation. He wrote the Declaration of Independence and he was the third president and he bought Louisiana and he gave the books to found to uh, refound the Library of Congress. He set out the grid that the United States is marked on. Um, there's just so many aspects of his life that play to, that are part of American history. And the idea that he, over a period of 38 years was connected to an African-American woman who lived on his plantation and slave woman on his plantation and had seven children, four who lived to adult, four whom lived to adulthood, changes the picture of his life. And it changes the picture of the life of America because Jefferson in many ways is written of almost as a personification of America. And what it does, what the story does is to sort of remind us that America was never just a white country. That from the very beginning, there were different people here and there was mixing going on and there was pain and uh, families, families that we can't, that we can hard to imagine, <laughs> you know, because of the strangeness of it. Uh, Sally Hemings was also the half sister of Jefferson's wife. They had the same father, John Wales, the person who I went to uh, England to search out and find out about his background. And so from there to think about slavery as not just an institution where people worked and didn't get paid, it was an institution where people held members of their family in legal bondage. And it tells you, it says something about the nature of that society that people don't think about very much. I was, had a conversation with a journalist who said to me that he never thought of Jefferson as a slave owner until, he, until the DNA report came back corroborating what I had said in my first book, suggesting that they, he did have uh, children with Sally Hemings. So um, it, it, it makes people, it's a visceral thing because we all have families. Right. I mean, we're, we don't we're not involved in the slave system, but we do have families and we think about we know what we think family is supposed to be. And yet here is some notion of family that Madison Hemings in his recollections of life at Monticello, as, as he said, as the son of Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, clearly talks about them as a family. He calls Jefferson father and he calls Sally Hemings mother. He talks about the family and their connection to one another. And we're sort of looking at this, I'm looking at this thinking, what is going on here? Uh, how, how, how did this reality, what did this reality mean for all of these people? So that's what my book is really about, is to try to explain what this was like. Um, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings don't exist, did not exist in a vacuum. This was a web of relationships between her mother, her brothers, 
his, her sisters, all of these people, you have to look at the entirety of it to try to understand or get some picture of what, what was going on on the mountain. Speaking of family, um, what, um, how have the descendants of, of Thomas Jefferson, uh, Jefferson's descendants um, and the Hemings descendants, um, how have they responded to this work and have you had experiences with them? Well, some members of Jefferson's family, the legal white family reject this idea. They still don't accept uh, the story, uh, the connection between the Hemingses. Some members do. Uh, I, I have gathered over the years that there were different stories told in different lines of families. I think this is, it, it's an interesting look at families in general that one set of siblings heard from their, you know, their ancestors or from their grandparents or so forth. Of course, this didn't happen. And others who said, of course it did. Uh, so, and I'm sure this happens in any family that there are differing contrasting visions of what of what the family story is. So that there's still a dispute among his legal white um, uh, descendants. I, what I would, I can't give a numerical view about this, but I would imagine that most of them probably don't accept this. And the ones who do accept this have had family reunions with members of the Hemings family. And so, and have established connections with them and accepted. So it's, it's like a family we all, our families are very complex, complex and we don't all have to speak with one tongue about something, um, but about a particular thing. And it's interesting since I wrote my first book, I think if I went back and did it over again, I would pay more attention to that aspect of it. I mean, I talk about, in the first book, I talk about how race shaped people's understanding about this and how class, a hierarchy, gentlemen, Virginia gentlemen don't lie. Um, and enslaved people are naturally mendacious. They naturally lie. Those kinds of stereotypes and beliefs, how that affected it. I don't think I wrote enough about, I kind of get it in the Hemings family, but I don't think in my first book that I wrote enough about how we construct our families. We draw a circle. We all draw circles around our families and say, who's in and who's out? You know, if somebody were to show up and say, oh, I'm a Gordon or, you know, whatever. Uh, and, and I knew nothing about that. Uh, I, your first thing would be defensiveness. I mean, because we think we know who we are, the story of who we are. Um, I don't think if I said, if somebody came to me and said, uh, my great, 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 great grandfather had a mistress or had children with a woman outside of wedlock, I would say, oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't feel as close to it. I get the sense that Jefferson's, because of who he is, because of his importance, Jefferson's descendants maybe collapse him, collapse some of those greats. He's like grandpa mm -hmm. instead of great, 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 great grandfather. And if someone said my grandfather had kids outside. I mean, I would, I knew him. So I, that would, I would feel more defensive about that than seven or six or seven generations past. So um, yeah, it's, it's a mix of feelings from those families about all of this and they will sort this out or not, but that's, you know, the family stories are not history. You know, I mean, people who have studied, Sandra Stanton, who was the senior research historian at Monticello until a few years ago. And she was the person who I went to when I wrote my first book, <coughs> knows more about these people's family than they do. I mean, we don't, we don't, we have a connection to family, but we don't necessarily know what was going on 200 years ago with our families. Hmm. Well, it certainly is an interesting look at, um, the Ameri American narrative that maybe we were taught for so long and now ha how it's changing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's important that these stories are told. I thank you so much for the gift of this book and I would recommend it to anybody. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, anybody interested. Um, now I would love for my colleague, Leslie, to ask some questions. Absolutely, thank you, Laura. And thank you, Annette, for being here uh, in this space with us once again. 
Um, I wanted to speak um, towards looking forward. Um, the story can teach us about uh, hope and looking towards the future. In this time and space, what does hope look like for you? Well, hope looks like a sort of dream that, or well, a hope that people can overcome differences, to recognize differences and respect differences and respect one another enough not to demonize others because of their differences. And thinking about my work from what, thinking about the institution of slavery and thinking about what happened afterwards when African-American people were still operating under the badges and incidents of slavery with Jim Crow and lynching and to think of the enormous waste that that amounted to, what we could have been as a country if everybody was able to realize their fullest potential, if the hope that people would not mire themselves in petty, you know, petty tyranny, uh, the tyranny of feeling superior to other people and that seeing your self-worth through um, the oppression of other people. So hope for me looks like people freeing themselves from that, those kinds of impulses and to recognize that we can be better as a country overall if all of us are strengthened. And most people just want to live their lives and have good lives for their families and you know, go forward and have hope for the future. I hope looks to me like people recognizing the humanity in others and working towards that, living their lives, keeping that at, at the center. We're human beings and we all, we have feelings and we should empathize with one another in ways that make it possible for us to, to live together without strife. There will always be strife, but we've had an unnecessary amount of it, I think in this country. And I think we can do better. Given that being the history and um, understanding your stance on hope, do you think that hope is universal or does hope differ from group to group, person to person, um, race to race, gender to gender? Is it all just one thread or does it look different for everyone? Well, I think people certainly have different hopes, you know, different individual kinds of hopes, but overall, I, I would say most people want peace and they want peace on real peace. I mean, there's a, the, they make a desolation and call it peace. The, you know, the talking about uh, the Romans in Scotland, uh, which is not real peace. <laughs> you know, you destroy things and then you say, okay, now we have peace. Um, I think most people, most people want peace but peace that is actually just. And uh, it doesn't always look the same. It's not the, we don't, as again, it's not a precise formula for that, but we have made progress in society to the extent that we have, and we have in the 20th century and into the 21st century, it's because of people recognizing the common desire to have peace on, on, on good terms and on fair terms. It's not an easy quest because there are some people who for turmoil, for reasons that I, I don't know, personal turmoil or whatever, there are some people who don't want that, who like the, ter the, for, uh, the for, you know, the, to foment uh, dissent and uh, anger. But I think most people want to live their lives uh, in peace and understand that you can't do that unless there is a degree of fairness or fairness and justice in society overall. I mean, that's the civil rights movement was based on that, uh, that, that idea of people coming together and they did for a time. And I think we can continue to do that. With the quest to peace, there's a lot of conversation around healing 
Are you hopeful that we will be able to reconcile our relationship with slavery in terms of the American, our American history? That's a tough one because <laughs> you can, it's very, very tough because I don't think you can have reconciliation unless people admit that there was a problem. And as we can see, there are still people who don't, who, who haven't come to the point where they understand that we have to speak truthfully about, about these matters. It, there's sort of a, a dual thing. On one hand, we're supposed to forget history, forget the, that part of history, but we're supposed to remember the glorious parts of it. Uh, the founding or the constitution, Philadelphia, 1787, 1776, those things. And we are supposed to remember those things, but it's, it's like I was saying about Jefferson before, you can't know the total, total circumstance. You can't know the total person, the total country without both of those things being there. You don't just remember the good things. You have to remember the bad things because that they work together. And uh, it's, so I, at one level, I think that's the most difficult thing is to think about reconciliation because there can be and there is reluctance to deal with the, the question of truth before you get to reconciliation. I mean, the, the famous thing we say about the truth and reconciliation in South Africa, there had to be truth first. It wasn't just reconciliation, let bygones be bygones. We have to admit what happened because there's no way to diagnose our problems today without knowing how we got here. You know, that to think about slavery as an institution that took black people out of civic life and then made their civic participation questionable even after they were freed, technically, legally freed, and how, you know, black dis disfranchisement, you know, a ma well, male and female, and then of course women at, at the point get the right to vote later, but black women are still operating under the disabilities. We're still operating under the disabilities caused by racial discrimination. This question of black citizenship, which is still on the table when people say, well, those votes are questionable. They're illegal votes. Um, you know, that it's a, it's a, people used to term dog whistle. It's not even a dog whistle, it's a, it's a whistle. Uh, to suggest that things that black people are involved in that involve citizenship, that we're not really a part of this Republic. That didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, that's a product of history. That's a product of how we came here. That's a product of how even after the civil war with the civil war amendments uh, and the attempt to bring black people into citizenship, there was recalcitrance, there was a pushback against that. And there's always been a pushback against that. We've overcome it in many ways. I mean, the passage of the Civil, uh, Civil War amendments, even though we know what happened with redemption in the South, but the second civil, I mean, the second American Revolution, which they call the Civil Rights Movement, bolstered those claims for equal citizenship and we're still fighting for it. But it's not, that isn't something that just dropped out of the sky. It's of a piece with what happen when African-Americans arrived in the United States, wasn't the United States, arrived in North America as enslaved people. So we're still, you know, I'm hopeful. Uh, I, I think reconciliation is possible, but it can't happen without a true reckoning or understanding of, of our past, of the details of our past. Hopefully, uh, as we strive for peace, we will also seek truth in this journey uh, that we call life. Mm -hmm. At this time, Annette, I would like for you to share, well, I invite for you to share um, some of your future projects that we are looking forward to um, that you have coming up. Well, uh, I have an ongoing, two ongoing projects. I'm doing a second volume of the Hemings family story. I'm going to take them you know, after Jefferson's death into the 19th century, uh, following the line of Eston Hemings who, and, and Madison Hemings. They, the two of them lived as African-American people in Ohio for a time. Eston then 
at some point leaves and moves to Madison, Wisconsin and changes his name and to Jefferson and um, changes his family's race, racial designation. So they live as white people from that time, that poor period on. His sons, two of them are in the Union Army John Wales Jefferson becomes a Lieutenant Colonel and writes dispatches back from Vicksburg. We're gonna follow his life. And then Madison Hemings who remained in the African-American community, two of his sons fight on the Union side, but as colored troops. Um, and so we have these two groups of people and Jefferson's legal, one of his legal grandsons, legal white grandsons, George with Randolph was for a time the secretary of the Confederacy so all these people are from the same place, um, coming from Jefferson on both sides of the war, on both sides of the color line um, in, in this particular struggle. I'm also doing a Jefferson reader on race where I'm taking his writings and, and doing introductory paragraphs, introductory essays about his writings on race. And my editor <laughs> asked me to do a book, actually I signed this up in um, June uh, with a September deadline, which I met, which is a short, a small memoir about growing up in Texas. So that will be out in the spring. So that, that was sort of an interlude out of nowhere <laughs> uh, that uh, he pulled on me and I decided to go ahead and do it. It's, it was a lot of fun writing a memoir and, um, and memoir and a history of Texas too. It's, it's a history of Texas told through my family. Thank you so much for sharing with us uh, your future works and your thoughts and feelings on hope with us. Mm -hmm. Chip, um, I turn it over to you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Leslie. So as we kind of move uh, toward ending this conversation, which I, I wish we didn't have to do, this has just been so incredibly meaningful. Uh, and there's so much more work we need to do. I, I'm wondering, you know, uh, I want to think with you and, and, and invite you to give us some thoughts on the uh, on the concept of the past and and the future. And I want to sort of draw upon uh, two two quotations and just get your reaction to them. Uh, one would be uh, Faulkner, who said, "The past is is not the past." It, the past is not dead. It's not even past, I mm -hmm. believe is what he said. The past is not dead. It's not even past. So that, that, you know, whether that concept of past is something of a misnomer as we think about the moral work ahead. And, and then the second is uh, a quote from James Baldwin, uh, who really uh, invites us to think about uh, history um, and the future says the great force of history comes from the fact that we carry it within us and are unconsciously controlled by it. History is literally present in all that we do. What thoughts do you have about how we define past being past and what it means for us to embody history within us as we think as a congregation about our work ahead? Mm -hmm. Well, it's funny you should say that because I used the Faulkner quote in my memoir to say that I disagree with that. Hmm. I think the past is the past, but like everything that was living, and this, go, this goes into the Baldwin quote, which I think I agree with more, is that the past is gone. You know, the past, the people of the past are not here. All of their attitudes, all of those things, I mean, they are in the past, but we do carry aspects of that with us. My mother is not with me anymore. Her life is, life on earth is past, but she and my father live within me. That's not the same as saying that she is physically here. I mean, it's a comforting thing to think that she's physically here, but she's not physically here. But everything that they put into me, all the things that I learned from them, my life with them is in me. And I think, Baldwin's quote captures that more, uh, better, that more and it kept in a better way, I think, than the, the Faulkner one. I, I, 
you know, maybe I might be taking him too literally on that thing, but I, but I think the past is gone, but traces of the past stay with us. And for thinking about the future and legacy, we understand that we're not hostages to the past. I think I have a suspicion that Faulkner's statement is, grows out of a, a Southern boy's lost cause connection. The idea is not wanting to let go of that. You know, he, he's, he was saying, I think another quote he says is that somewhere every day there's a boy, Pickett's charge, uh, a boy is, is going with Pickett's charge. Well, he, what boy? More of the people in Mississippi fought for the Union, black soldiers than on the other side. Um, so then the Confederacy in sheer numbers. Um, so I think we don't wanna be hostage to the past. I mean, to saying that the past is not gone, I think keeps us there, mires us in that. The Baldwin quote says that history is very, very much important and past is important, the past is important, but it's something we carry within us and we can decide, we have agency. We can decide how we're going to use that, what direction we think what we've learned should take us. And so I, I think the second quote fits more with my understanding of the way the world works. And I think that's the one that gives us the capacity to move forward. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I think in many ways, let that be our prayer. Uh, that as we reflect on so much of history that we still need to understand, uh, that we we might not approach that with a kind of defensiveness, mm -hmm. uh, but with, with a real openness <laughs> and continue to think about uh, what is our moral agency and, and what role we can play in our families, uh, in our neighborhoods, in our communities uh, to work toward a new kind of future together. Uh, thank you so much for this time. Thank you. It's Thank truly you so been our honor to be with you. <coughs> and uh, we wish you all of God's blessings as you move forward in your work ahead. Same to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.